given the largely positive reception to the innovative visionary narrative created in the first Hellraiser, a sequel to further explore this world made logical sense. Not long after the original's release, the sequel was quickly put into production, and in 1988, just a year after the original's release, Hellbound Hellraiser 2 was released, and the result is a movie that both organically and effectively expands upon its predecessor, while also falling a bit short as well. Hey everyone, this is Jan Mann, and this is a look back at Hellbound Hellraiser 2. Stepping in for Clive Barker to direct Hellraiser 2 was Tony Randall, who had worked on and helped edit the first movie. This, along with much of the same cast and crew returning, gives Hellbound the sense that filming immediately continued after the first movie. It has the same tone, feel, and overall aesthetic. The plot, given that it is Barker's story being produced, also feels like a genuine continuation of the story. It picks up with Kirsty from the first film being institutionalized after her father was killed by Frank, telling the doctors and nurses what seems to be crazy nonsense regarding the Cenobites and their hellish otherworldly dimension that she saw and experienced. However, her lead doctor, Dr. Chenard, is highly intrigued by her story and has been secretly investigating the puzzle box, its configuration, history, and gateway to the hellish dimension. Listening closely to Kirsty's story, he eventually obtains the mattress that the wicked Julia had died on, and after he allows one of his mentally ill patients to cut himself with razors on the mattress, the blood provides another gateway that allows the physical form of Julia to materialize in this world, just as it had done with Frank in the first movie. Jannard then kills for the seductive Julia, making her flesh again, just as she had done for Frank, until she ultimately double-crosses him, just as Frank had done to her, in turn giving the hellish world the opportunity to consume him and the god of hell, Leviathan, to turn him into a Cenobite. Outside the movie feeling and looking like the first film tonally and aesthetically, part of its better aspect is its elaboration on the dimensional hell of the Cenobites. The hallways, the delusions or illusions, and the redundant hell of lust and blood that Frank dwells in, all of which were merely stated or hinted at in the first movie. Though perhaps the most interesting addition is the backstory of the Cenobites and the realization that they were once human. There is real emotion earned, giving these characters a sad human background and provides an unexpected way of looking at them, taking them from hellish beings to actual people who once were. Their portrayals and the actors reprising their roles are also strong, as they were in the first film. The same goes for Julia, who is now full-blown seductive evil, further showing how she's as much or more so the star of the first two films as Pinhead or anyone else. Though Ashley Lawrence's portrayal of Kirsty is still a little stilted in comparison, and Dr. Chenard's turn into a Cenobite doesn't feel quite as instantly menacing as the original four did or do. The performance from Kenneth Cranham is strong, but the design of his Cenobite form, again, isn't as intimidating, nor is the animation of some of his killing or torturing appendages. Other new characters are a little underdeveloped, such as Tiffany, whose main purpose in the plot is to be a mute whiz at solving puzzles, opening the Leviathan Labyrinth for Dr. Chenard, and thus assisting in his destruction by closing the door or portal to hell, or even worse, Kyle, Dr. Chenard's assistant, who quickly becomes a love interest for Kirsty, yet dies shortly thereafter at the hands of Julia. What about Steve, her boyfriend from the first film? Kirsty's pretty quick to forget about him to develop feelings for Kyle. Regardless, the ending with Dr. Chenard's demise and Tiffany and Kirsty escaping feels like a legitimate closure to both movies. And that's despite Kirsty somehow perfectly fitting the dead Julia's skin over hers to trick Dr. Chenard to the point of believing it's actually Julia. How would that even be possible? This is also despite the last stinger involving a moving man being pulled into Julia's mattress and a swinging pillar rising from it seem like an unnecessary tease for a future sequel. Still, Hellbound Hellraiser 2 
while not the seminal innovative art form the first one is, does effectively expand upon the mythos and world of Hellraiser, with some equally nightmarish visuals and a continuity that makes it feel like the first film never stopped rolling. <laughs> 